Before we get to the movie, I have some sad news to report. His death has been falsely announced on this show before, but I'm afraid now he has passed away. M. Emmett Walsh. Yeah. Well, I know you're a fan of his uh, as yeah. well as me. There comes a time in every film buff's life, I think, when they start learning the names of actors yeah. whose names are not obvious. Yep. I was probably in my mid or late teens, and his was one of the first names I learned because I always liked whenever he showed up in anything. When they announce his death and they're going through his credits, and I'm like, going, I totally forgot he was in Blade Runner. He was in Slapshot. <laughs> yes, that was another one. <laughs> and I had seen that one just a few years ago. And Lewis Gossett Jr. died as well. Yeah, yeah. Another one. Yeah, some of those people who just become part of your life because you see them. For those of you who may not know, if you want to see even more of M. Emmett Walsh, you can watch him in the movie Straight Time, where he is handcuffed to a chain link fence and pantsless. True. Wow. <laughs> Welcome back to the basement, Bill Bowles. I'm glad that you're here, and I'm glad that I have a movie to surprise you with in this top secret envelope. I can't wait. Anyone who knows you knows that you're a lover of the classics. Shakespeare. And the rest. <laughs> And that's what this movie is. It's not Shakespeare, but it is another well-renowned personage in literature. Okay. That's a sentence you should never use. <laughs> I don't recommend it. If you expected to see Charles Dickens today, then I would say that you had great expectations. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Released in 1946, Great Expectations was directed by David Lean and stars John Mills, Valerie Hobson, Alec Guinness, and Gene Simmons. Not the guy with the tongue, but the lady with the acting. Mm. The screenplay was written by Lean and several others, including his wife, Kay Walsh, based on a 1939 stage version of the novel written by Alec Guinness. He's a writer as well as a Jedi. Several actors from that production, including Mr. Guinness, reprised their roles for Lean's film. The film would go on to be nominated for five Oscars, including Best Picture, and winning two for Best Black and White Art Direction and Best Black and White Cinematography. Those are Oscars that no longer exist. What do you think? Have you seen this before? I have not. Oh, excellent. As we know, spring is right around the corner, and right around that corner is summer. And I bet you have some great expectations for summer fun with your family. Well, this gift could help. Oh. <laughs> yes! Oh. Water balloons. You fill yeah. them up with water and you throw them at children. <laughs> well, come on out of that bleak house of yours and come on over to the old leather couch where you won't experience any hard times, only a bit of culture known as Great Expectations. David Lean. He has time enough to lean and time <laughs> enough to clean. Great Expectations begins with a boy named Pip. I called myself Pip. In some parts of the country, I am called Seed. <laughs> And in other parts, I'm called Dots on Dice. He's going to the graveyard to visit his dead parents. Suddenly, there's a man there. He's an escaped convict. Keep still, you little devil, or I'll cut your throat. Turns him upside down, shakes him, gets an apple out of the deal. That's my mother. And is that your father along with your mother? Yes, sir, him too. Late of this parish. Ah. Well, let's dig him up and shake him. <laughs> Bring me some tools so I can cut off these chains. And if you don't... Your art and liver will be tore out and roasted and it. Well, now I'm hungry. <laughs> Pip runs back home to the blacksmith's family that he lives with. Oh, it's hard out here for a Pip. He doesn't want to go back out and help out that scary fugitive, but he's afraid of what'll happen if he doesn't. So he goes to the larder. What are you looking for, Pip? <laughs> Someone should have fed that rabbit long ago. He takes this fancy pie. He goes to the tool shed and takes some tools. He goes back out into the wilderness. He sees the fugitive, but it's not him. It's a different fugitive. <laughs> Introverts. He finds the other fugitive. He gives him the food and the tools. You done good, Pip. I'll only beat you for 20 minutes. I gotta go. There's a fancy dinner happening tonight. At that fancy dinner, the lady of the house says, hey, I got a special treat for everybody. It's a pie. A savory pork pie. Nope. <laughs> Luckily, in burst the local militia. There's some convicts out in the outside, and we're going to go get them, so come with us. They see these two guys wrestling together. They hate each other. Stop wrestling in the mud, man. It's too sexy. <laughs> They're captured. It was a year later. Puberty was hitting me something <laughs> fierce. Do you know who Miss Havisham is? Yes. Who? She's a strange lady. She wants a young boy to come by her house so she can watch him play. It's a thing. 
So she scrubs him up, she dresses him up, and sends him over to old Miss Havisham's. That's right, Pip, smarten up. We'll make a <laughs> poncy blouse wearer out of you yet. Mr. Pumbletook takes him there. It's funny, these Dick Dickens stories always have funny names. Pip and such. And there's this little girl there. Her name's Estella, and she's very rude. Come on, old boy. He goes into this big room. There's Mrs. Havisham. She's wearing an old moth-eaten wedding dress. And everything's dusty. You're not afraid of a woman who has never seen the sun since you were born. Kind of. <laughs> I mean, I'm sitting here watching a movie, and I'm kind of afraid of that just by you saying it. Her life essentially stopped at the moment her wedding did not go off the way it was supposed to. I don't know what day it is. I don't know what month it is. And I have a fancy. I should like to see someone play. Vince, Vince, Vince. <laughs> you stupid, clumsy, laboring boy. She says many hard things of you, but you say nothing of her. I want you to play the dozens, boy. Talk about her mama. <laughs> he keeps going back to see Miss Havisham and Estella. Am I pretty? Oh, so pretty. Am I pretty and witty and gay? Am I insulting? So insulting. So in I, I can't rhyme insulting. There, take that, you cross little monster. Pip meets this young boy. He's just an energetic little punk and he wants to fight. They engage in fisticuffs. Pip easily punches this kid out multiple times. Estella lets Pip kiss her on the cheek. <laughs> What is up with this girl? Does she like him? Does she not like him? Bye-bye. Uh... I hate you. I love you. <laughs> Goodbye. Please come again, you wretch. Three months later, my sister became ill and was laid to rest in the churchyard on the marshes. There's this new woman in the house, Biddy. Biddy, I want you to help me. Biddy, Biddy. Biddy. Biddy, Biddy, Biddy. Pip, at one point, confides in Biddy his great dream to one day grow up to be a gentleman. Oh, I wouldn't if I was you, Pip. I don't wouldn't you, answer. Biddy? <laughs> don't you think you're happy as you are? Yes, I'm not happy, Biddy. <laughs> How do you come here? Miss Havisham sent for me, sir. Well, behave yourself. I have a pretty large experience of boys. Well, fine, I know all about them. <laughs> I've eaten many of them. Estella informs him she's going off to France to become a lady. Pip is very sad because he's in love with Estella. Six years later, Pip is a blacksmith's apprentice. A lawyer shows up, Mr. Jaggers. Now, Joseph Gargerin. Have you heard of a reverse mortgage? <laughs> a mysterious unknown benefactor has uh, put up the funds for Pip to go to London and be brought up as befits a young gentleman of great expectations. Ding. You will need some new clothes. There, I have made it rain. <laughs> well, Joseph Gargery, you look dumbfounded. No, nope, just dumb, sir. <laughs> A young gentleman of great expectations. Next week on Great Expectations. <laughs> That is quite an outfit. <laughs> Not sure where to begin. The weird scarf or the pilgrim hat. <laughs> so long, Biddy. <laughs> oh, I'd so hope to marry him and be Miss Biddy Pip. <laughs> hey, London. Mr. Jaggers. <laughs> Mr. Jagger's assistant is Mr. Wemmick. He's got interesting hair. He's got a yearly allowance of 250 pounds, a not insignificant amount of money. Goodbye and good luck, Mr. Pitt. Thank you. Mike! I'm hungry. Bring me a <laughs> bucket of cabbages. <laughs> He's staying at Barnard's Inn, and his roommate is Mr. Herbert Pocket. You may recognize him from a certain movie about stars and wars. Or maybe you won't. I didn't at first. Now, that is Alec Guinness? Yeah. Oh, yes, Miss Havisham. Oh, wow. This is that young man he used to fight with at Miss Havisham's. The idea of it's being you. Well, the idea of it's being you. <laughs> Punch. <laughs> but it's not usually considered necessary to fill the mouth to its utmost capacity. Oh, oh, I'm so interested. <laughs> not at all, I'm sure. <laughs> I hate you. <laughs> Let's drink to London. London. You will never find a more wretched hive of scum and villainy. <laughs> Pip in various ways, learns how to be a gentleman. He and Herbert throw lavish parties. They run up debts. And then, of course, he goes to see Mr. Uh, 
up is Mr. Jaggers. What do you suppose you are living at the rate of? Uh, sound? Uh, <laughs> who presents him with a check for 500 pounds. Probably from his mystery benefactor. Now he's got plenty of money. Joe the blacksmith comes to London to visit. Kind of makes an ass of himself. There's the hat incident. You see him put his hat upon the mantel. <laughs> oh dear. It's toppled. I'll take whichever is most agreeable to yourself. What you say to coffee? Thank you kindly, sir. The rest of the movie is just him putting his hat on the mantle and it falls off and he gets up and he puts it back and that's the rest of the movie. <laughs> The hell happened? <laughs> what is wrong with Joe? You daft smithy. <laughs> That's the last straw. If Mr. Gargery will excuse me, I will go down to the porter's lodge to fetch the morning's letters. And vomit. <laughs> Pip goes back home to visit Miss Havisham. Blue Ball Rochester. Blue Ball Rochester? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's Pip. <laughs> How do you do, Miss Havisham? I do horribly. Look at my house. Look at how I choose to live my life. I'm doing terribly. You've known me for years. I, I'm a wreck. Estella has returned. She's all grown up. Estella is coming to London, so they will be in the same circles. Oh, I have a heart to be stabbed at or shot at, but you know what I mean. What? what? Who's, who's after you, Estella? Are you in trouble? Just blink. Blink twice if you're in trouble. And Mrs. Havisham tells him. If she tears your heart to pieces, love her. I developed her into... I let myself in. <laughs> Shall I give you a ride, Miss Havisham? Once round? I need to get my 10,000 steps in. And do you thrive with Mr. Pocket Pip? Yes, indeed. We're like two pips in a pocket. <laughs> that fate threw her in the way of Bentley Drummond. Oh, what? Bentley. A romantic rival for Estelle's affections. One rainy night, Pip is home alone, and there's a knock at the door. He's an imposing, black-clad man. Do you wish to come in? Yes, of course. Please, yes, come in. Sit. Please don't murder me. Um, Not only is this the fugitive that he helped... The churchyard. The churchyard on the marshes. You shook an apple out of my pants. <laughs> Do you want to shake me and see what comes out? <laughs> But this is his benefactor. He went off to Australia and amassed a fortune, and he's been financing Pip's lifestyle as a thank you for helping him all those years ago. His name is Abel Magwitch. Magwitch has put himself in great danger. He is still a fugitive from justice. And if they catch him, it's going to be bad news. He must be got out of the country, and I shall have to go with him. But first, I need to go see Miss Havisham. He finds out that Estella is indeed going to marry Bentley Drummle. How can you fling yourself at such a man? Should I rather fling myself at you, Pip? Yeah. <laughs> he leaves, and suddenly, fire. <laughs> the whole room is ablaze. Everything is burning. Bentley, Bentley. Pip tries to put out the fire. He's beating her <laughs> as she's burning. Miss Havisham dies. Oh, no, I'll have to set the table again. <laughs> it's bad news, folks. Pip returns to London. He gets a note from Wemmick. <laughs> That other convict that Magwitch had a wrestling match with, he's in London, and he's found out that his enemy is here. Magwitch and Herbert are hiding out in a place down by the river. They concoct an elaborate plan. The following day, I sent Herbert to make some inquiries. He screwed it up because he is a dope. They're going to sneak him out in a rowboat and hide and wait for this other boat to come by, and then they're going to put him on that boat, and he's dressed up as a sea captain. And they're going to put him on there. It's a really elaborate plan. They are being watched by that other criminal. Magwitch tells Pip, you know, I used to have a child and she died. It's a dark part of my life, dear boy. Ain't worth telling. Septimy therapist. And so now you're kind of the son I've never had, to coin a phrase. The plan is working perfectly, except there's another boat. And it's got the old scar-faced man who hates Magwitch. There's a great fight between the two boats and the steamship bearing down upon them. Everyone ends up in the water. The old man is almost killed by a spinning wheel. But Pips jumps into the water and saves him. Abel Magwitch is arrested. And of course, the way these things go, he is sentenced to be hanged. <laughs> 
Pip goes to see Jaggers. You no longer inherit his money. That will be claimed by the Crown. The money is no interest to me. If you had been a blood relation, it might have been different. There was a child. So you think there was a child, do you? No, well, you know, do you? How dare you interrupt me during scrubby time? You know that daughter that he talks about? She actually didn't die. And she just might be Estella. The love of Pip's life. Pip goes to see Magwitch in the prison infirmary. He's sick. He's not even going to live to be hanged. Your daughter is alive. She is a lady. And very beautiful. And she's going to marry a dickhead. And Magwitch dies with a smile on his face. Pip falls ill from all of this. Oh, he's in a fugue state. Yeah. That's what he is. Turns out he's Jack the Ripper. Jack the Pipper. He wakes up to discover that he's back at his old home. How long, dear? That's a rather personal question, Pip. Have you been here all the time? Oh, pretty nigh, old chap. Every night I get up and I put my hat on the mantle and it falls off and I laugh. <laughs> Did he? <laughs> Pip decides to visit Miss Havisham's old home. The old Havisham place is for sale. It's a bit of a fixer-upper. <laughs> Estella is there. Hey, I heard you're getting married. Nope. I have no husband, Pip. Yes. I've not heard. Yes. <laughs> Bentley Drummle found out about her true parentage. He wanted nothing more to do with her. So you know what? I'm just going to sit here in the old Havisham place. I'm just going to sit here in the darkness and the dust. I shall like it here, Pip. It's pre-cobweb. Away from the world and all its complications. I shall be Miss Havisham 2.0. <laughs> <laughs> Pip is not having it. Tears down those curtains. Estella, come with me. Out into the sunlight. We can get married and we'll be happy. And they do. Sometimes happiness is only something that can be accomplished when one has great expectations. Have you read this book? I have not. Neither have I. Mm. I wish that one of us had. <laughs> Would have helped to keep track of the ins and outs of the plot. Well, well, I actually thought the plot was very easy to keep track of. The screenplay did a really good job of distilling the novel. I, I would like to know what they got rid of. Right. Yeah. I'm guessing probably a lot of unnecessary stuff. Dickens was paid yeah. by the word. Right. The thing with uh, the, all the, the the boats and the plan to get Magwitch out of London, that all seems like the kind of thing like... Well, it's another month for the magazines. I, I need another chapter of this book. And yeah, uh, maybe it, there's a whole thing about That plan was probably really, really detailed. Yeah. One thing I never expected from this movie was an action sequence. <laughs> <laughs> it's not yeah. bad. There are times where I was sort of thinking like, well, why do we care about Pip? Why do we care if he becomes a gentleman? Maybe we're supposed to see ourselves in Pip. Just yeah. like, if I was a young man and I had this opportunity, that would be very exciting. And so yeah. I want Pip to succeed in this, because I would want to succeed. For me, it kind of just hinges on the character of Abel Magwitch. Okay. What was it about him that the, the young man, Pip, you know, uh, helped? Why did he help him? You know, because he, he's very threatening, he's very scary at the beginning. He about... helped him because the guy told him a spook story well, that's about part what would it. happen to him. That's part of it. And, and I'm wondering if maybe it's not just sort of a British class system kind of thing. He's maybe a foundling, he's living with this blacksmith. He instantly identified this convict as a, a sort of father figure. Yeah. I need to help him. This was based on a play that Alec Guinness wrote. How did they do the fire on stage? <laughs> How did they do the I boat rescue? <laughs> They probably just talked about it. Yeah, well, yeah. Wasn't that boat rescue crazy that we just did? Oh, my hair's all wet. <laughs> so here's a fun fact about the movie. Okay. Uh, the lead, John Mills, plays Pip. Yeah. From his young adulthood through about his mid-20s. So like 20 to 25. And the actor was 38 years old. Wow. He pulls it off. You can tell his face is a little older than it should be. As much as Estella is only portrayed as this, you know, mean little girl, really, um... I was very pleased that they ended up together at the end and that he saved her from repeating Miss Havisham's uh, thing. I found it uh, maybe not moving, but, but, but satisfying, certainly. Like a well-earned, happy ending. Kind of. I suppose the theme of the story is change. Change is a good thing, and that Pip is this boy who could easily have been a blacksmith his whole life mm -hmm. and lived in the same town and never gone outside it. But he's given this opportunity to change. And he was also... He had such a deep experience with a woman who could not change or would not change. I guess that's what the story means. Accepting opportunities and 
going outside of your of of the world that you know is mm-hmm. inevitably a good thing. Anything else to say about great expectations? No. Have you ever had a mystery benefactor? No. Yeah, me neither. Never had a benefactor. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody looking out for me. Great Expectations was a great fun time, and now we're going to have some more fun with Seen It. Seen It. KMAC 005. Seen It, The Miracle of Morgan's Creek. Perhaps Preston Sturgis's purest comedy. Seen It. Seen It. Pregnancy. Unknown father. It is uh, really daring and fascinating to see all the ways that Sturgis and the screenwriters... Actually, he was the screenwriter. Yeah. He was the first writer-director Yeah. before Billy Wilder. The ways he, he got around censors, those techniques that people use today, yeah. like they put a really shocking thing to distract from this less shocking thing. So the censor will... It's like a red herring, you know. Yeah. They'll, they'll get rid of the decoy and this one will sneak in. Yeah. Stur just invented that. I, in fact, just rewatched it this morning. I wow. Was laughing out loud. Yeah, it's very funny. It was very funny. And Eddie Brackett, remembered these days only for his small part in Home Alone 2. He kicked around for a long time. Yeah. They were all so good. Charles Demarest. William Demarest. William Demarest. Oh, Uncle, we, Uncle Charlie. We so seldom get to see the physical comedy of William Demarest. <laughs> oh, he's taking a kick at his daughter as she leaves the room. <laughs> well, he was an old vaudevillian, and he that was oh. what he used to do. That was how he yeah. uh, made his bones Yeah, and broke his bones. <laughs> Evan Gabovich mentions Anatomy of a Fall. Seen it. Seen it. Anatomy of a Fall, kind of a play on Anatomy of a Murder. Sure. As a title, because you don't know if it's a murder or whatever it is. But I really enjoyed Anatomy of a Fall as a sort of a mystery, but, but a courtroom thing. Yeah, you really get to see the very conversational style of French jurisprudence. <laughs> yeah. I wanted to scream at the screen. Isn't anybody going to object? <laughs> yeah. I was an armchair lawyer watching. <laughs> Objection hearsay. Objection yeah. argumentative. Yeah. Objection leading the witness. The guy's on the stand and he's talking about, oh yeah, the murder, clearly a murder. And they just kind of go to the defendant in the room. What do you think of that? What do you think of what he said? <laughs> no. Didn't like it. No, okay. All right. All right. And then at one point, Someone says, objection. And I'm like, oh, did you just wake up from your nap? <laughs> W-U-S-T-L Bear 82. If you want to see a better movie with Steve Railsback, try The Stuntman. He plays a fugitive from justice who is accidentally trapped on a movie set with a crazed director, Peter O'Toole. Not to mention a very rude mechanical bear. Seen it. You know, yeah. I saw it on this DVD, which you sold me. <laughs> At your yard sale like 10 years ago. Yeah. I love it. And you upsold me on this. I came up to you with a pile of DVDs and you're like, Stuntman, you should get that one. (laughs) And I said, okay, here's another $2. (laughs) And I watched it finally and I hated it. (laughs) I did. (laughs) Steve Railsback, why is this guy on any movie screen? He's got all the good looks of the Piltdown man. (laughs) And he's not a very good actor. Yeah, you know, oh, he gets true. all googly-eyed about Nam and those VC, and it's just so yeah. silly. Whenever I do think of that movie, I never think of him specifically, yeah. you know? Hollywood loves movies about Hollywood and that sort of thing. Yeah, and it's a dirty Hollywood movie. It's like the Day of the Locust. Yeah. And it's also, it's like Apocalypse Now, you know, the lunatics have taken over the asylum. Yeah. And there's this guy caught in the middle of it. It felt like every scene of that movie was its own little movie. Mm. And it was telling its own story. And it had its own stars. From scene to scene, it just felt like I'm watching a different movie now. And Mm. now it's different. And now it's different again. And now it's different again. And it was like, you know, looking at a pile of broken glass. Caboose the Goose says, Seen it. A funny thing happened on the way to the forum? (laughs) Question mark. Zero Mostel is the funniest human ever to live. Seen it. Seen it. And after recently watching A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum, I might be inclined to agree with you. Me as well. His mastery of... Using his face and his voice to take any material and just elevate it. Yeah. Yeah. And, Even and these kind of hokey jokes. And it is definitely the huge influence for Mel Brooks's History of the World Part 1. Like, it's got the same tone. Yeah. It's got the same style of jokes. I think they both have Jack Guilford. They probably do. <laughs> yeah. And it's a Richard Lester film. Yeah. If you didn't know that from Roy Kinnear being in it, you would know it from the... <laughs> Chariots chase at the end. <laughs> yeah. And from a uh, young Michael Crawford falling down. Oh my every God. Which way. He falls face first down a f- wooden flight of stairs. Yeah. And it's not a stuntman. It's not trick photography. <laughs> and he gets to the bottom. He kind of goes, Ugh. God damn it. I would be out for a week. <laughs> yeah. The one thing I didn't like about it was the 
Richard Lester style. I didn't like the way he did the opening number. Mm. Um, I didn't like the chariot scene at the end. It was too long. It was too frenetic. And it just got boring at a certain point. Go to our website, welcometothebasementshow.com. Click on those PayPal donation buttons and make a contribution to Welcome to the Basement. We sure do appreciate it. I'm going to shout out some of our recent one-time donors. It's an international crew today. First off, we have from the UK, David and Ian. From Scotland, which is also the UK, but it's Scotland, uh, Andrew. And then over there in Finland, Mika and Tavi. Thank you all for donating. Mwah. There you go. Good, strong thumb yes. kiss. <laughs> Bill is going to be here next week for unboxing. We're going to open some mail and have some fun. You should join us then, and right now you should take a look at this. This woman's legal advisor knows an eccentric and very rich lady who is anxious to adopt a little girl. I understand. I'm a little girl. <laughs> Your art in liberal be tore out and roasted and ate 